you can. So welcome. Maybe you have been here during the break as well. Um, we are having our second keynote. Thank you for Jako and Tommy for starting this conference. Um, my name is Mia Purti. I work as a nurse and a family therapist uh, in Western Lapland, have been there about 19 years now. I also train in family therapy and open dialogue. Uh, and I am as a host during this keynote uh, presented by Natalie True Bold, but she will be introducing herself soon. But we also have Catherine. Yeah, so I'm uh, Kat Clark. I'm a researcher working on the Odessi trial, which is a, a trial of open dialogue in England that's going on at the moment. And I'll be um, in the chat. So if there's any particular questions, you can put them in the Q&A section and I'll try to direct them. Um, but any comments, any thoughts in the chat would be very welcome. So I look forward to hearing from you. Yeah. So Natalie has been working with the guidance on community mental health services, promoting person-centered and rights-based approaches where open dialogue is one of the good practices. Uh, Natalie, it's nice to meet you almost in person after being in collaboration uh, via email during the last few years. Um, yes. I am giving the stage to you now. Thank you very much. Um, I will share my presentation my slides sorry sorry just just give me one second uh sorry i'm having trouble there it is okay all right sorry about that i'm just need to go back up so my name is uh, Natalie Drew. I work, um, I am the technical officer at the uh, Policy, Law and Human Rights Unit at the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse at the World Health Organization um, in Geneva. So at the headquarters of, of the Geneva office. Um, so it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers, in particular, Rafaela Focabello for inviting me to talk at this conference um, about the work that the World Health Organization is doing to promote rights and recovery in human rights um, in mental health, specifically through the Quality Rights Initiative. So as many as, of you know, and as Mia mentioned a couple of weeks ago, we officially launched our new WHO guidance on person-centered and rights-based community mental health services. And the response to that launch has been really overwhelming. We actually had the launch itself garnered uh, 7,000, an audience of 7,000 people. And also since then, hundreds of people have gone on to undertake extensive dissemination of the materials and also many people are now contacting their governments and calling for on their governments to put in place uh, rights-based services along similar lines as those that we've uh, included in the new WHO guidance. So it's all the more a pleasure to be here at this event because, as Mia said, Open Dialogue is one of the 28 um, progressive innovative services that we've uh, showcased in the documents. Um, and just a word about why we created this document. It's really a very simple reason. The fact is we know that in many parts of the world, mental health services are failing people. Um, so over the last several decades, through UN reports, country reports, NGOs, uh, media reports, we know that the rights of people with psychosocial disabilities are being violated, that they're experiencing discrimination in many sectors. So for example, in the healthcare sector, we know that uh, people experience violence, abuse and neglect. Uh, people are also given disempowering messages by by health services very often that take away power, that take away dignity, that take away their hope. For example, they're told that they may never be able to finish their education or that they shouldn't continue their job or that they can't make decisions for themselves or that they shouldn't have hopes and dreams and aspirations because if they fail to meet these things, then their condition may deteriorate. And then, of course, we know that in the community, uh, people uh, also experience wide ranging violations. So in education, in employment, uh, in housing and social sectors as well. And then, of course, in countries all over the world, we have substitute decision making laws. 
uh, that severely restrict people from making decisions on all aspects of their lives about their treatment, obviously, but also about other areas such as how they're going to spend their money, who they want to live with and so on. So really, it's in this context uh, that we developed the WHO guidance on rights based and person centered community mental health services in order to really push forward a recovery oriented and human rights uh, based uh, services uh, in countries everywhere. What I want to do in this presentation is I want to first introduce and give you an overview of this new guidance that we've developed, but then I also want to uh, outline other key areas that we're working in as part of the quality rights initiative that are also important in terms of achieving sustainable positive change in uh, mental health systems. So. Just so let me start by giving you an overview of what the new WHO guidance is about. So firstly, it has a number of different aims and objectives. So one key objective, for example, is to inform stakeholders, stakeholders who are responsible for the provision of mental health care, uh, of the benefits of community based mental health services, but but services that actually respect rights and have a focus on recovery. Uh, another key aim, another key objective is to demonstrate that it is possible to develop person centered and rights based services and also achieve good health and social outcomes. And then a third aim and objective is really to inspire countries to take action to develop and to scale up these community based mental health services and also to clearly uh, explain how they can go about doing this as well. So uh, a word about who the guidance is for, it can be used by many different groups and it seems that it is being used and adopted by many different groups already, but I'm just going to focus on a few key people that we had in mind when we drafted uh, these materials. So, for example, it would be useful for policymakers, uh, including those working not only in the health sector, but in the social se sector to encourage and support them to align uh, to, 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 to set new policy directions in mental health and to align their policies and laws and also their financing me mechanisms towards uh, scaling up rights based services and to ensure that these services really become a norm rather than the exception in countries. Then we also have service planners and providers, and that could also include NGOs and other groups who are responsible for directly providing uh, care and support, and they can use uh, the guidance and good practice services that we illustrate in the document as a frame for transforming their own services or for creating new services as well. And then, of course, people with lived experience and also organizations of persons with disabilities and other advocates can use these materials to advocate for these positive changes uh, within mental health systems and services. So just a word about what it's the document comprises of the content. So it's made up of several different things we have here on this slide. You first have what we call the overall document and this overall document basically sets the global context, the global situation that we're facing in the area of mental health and hu human rights right now. It also outlines the international uh, human rights standards, which countries actually have obligations to, to meet, particularly in, specifically in the area of mental health. And then we also outline uh, the recovery approach in that section. Uh, this, uh, this overall document also provides a dedicated section summarizing uh, the 28 good practices that we've included in, in the overall guidance. It also um, explains the steps that we need to take in order to move towards a more holistic type of services services that are really taking into account housing, education, employment, social protections, and so on. And then finally, also this guidance document, this overall guidance document outlines some of the key recommendations, the specific, specific actions that countries need to take really in order to be able to integrate a person-centered and rights-based service framework in, into health and social se sectors as well. So that is the overall document. And then in addition to the overall document, we also have a series of technical packages, seven technical packages in total. Um, and basically each of these technical packages addresses a different category of service. So there are several packages. There are different packages, for example, 
uh, one focused on crisis services, another on hospital based services, one looking specifically at community centers, another at peer support. We have one dedicated to community outreach services, supported living, and then also um, one that looks at com uh, comprehensive mental health service networks. And this last technical package basically highlights the different countries and regions that have put in place a combination of all these different types of services that I've just mentioned in a cohesive way, in a way to form a comprehensive network of services, which also interfaces with the social sector. So in each of these uh, technical packages, um, there are a number of different things we have. We first of all detail, we give a very detailed description of the service itself and also how it operates but also a detailed description um, and information about how each of the services specifically implementing key rights criteria. So, uh, in other words, how are, they, how are they implementing the right to exercise legal capacity? How are they implementing alternatives to coercive practices, participation, uh, community inclusion and recovery principles? Secondly, in each of these packages, uh, we provide practical insights into the challenges that different services have faced as they evolved and also the different strategies and solutions that they've put in place in order to overcome the different uh, challenges. And then thirdly, each of the technical packages presents a series of very concrete action steps that people can work through in order to basically set up a similar service in their own country. And here on this slide, you see the that we've listed each of the 28 services that are showcased in the documents listed according to the different service categories. Now, so you see there that open dialogue, for example, is listed along with other crisis services that we've showcased. Um, it's important to acknowledge that no service obviously fits perfectly into or uniquely into one category. And this is also, of course, true for open dialogue, since so all of these services um, undertake a multitude of different functions uh, that touch upon many of the other categories uh, that we've listed here. Uh, and so we've been very sure to reflect this fact at the very start of every uh, description of the services that we've included in, uh, in these uh, technical packages. So what do all of these services that uh, we've included in the documents have in common? Well, each of the services that were selected because they met a number of specific criteria for promoting human rights. Uh, specifically, we're talking about services that respect uh, people's right to legal capacity. So in other words, their right to their, their choices, their decisions about their treatment, uh, their care and their support and so on. Uh, we also selected them based on services that implement strategies to end the use of coercive practices such as seclusion and restraint, as well as other forms of uh, abuse as well. And then we're also talking here about services that promote participation and involvement of people with lived experience and, and involvement also in terms of how they, uh, in, in terms of people with lived experience acti actively uh, being involved in the running of the services themselves, and that's very important. Uh, we also looked at services that promote community inclusion, so by linking people to different services and supports, uh, so linking people to social welfare benefits, housing, uh, employment opportunities, uh, legal aid, and so on. And then finally, we're also talking about services that provide person-centered and holistic care addressing all the important areas of a person's life, so relationships, work, family, education, rather than just focusing solely on diagnosis, on medication, on symptom reduction, which is the case in so many uh, services in, in so many parts of the world today where that is the primary focus and in some cases the only focus. Um, so none of the services that we've outlined is perfect, but but these examples, nevertheless, they really provide inspiration and hope as they've taken positive steps to align themselves to current international human rights standards, uh, including the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And they've managed to do this in spite of uh, existing within policy and legal frameworks that don't actually align 
with the CRPD and other international standards. So it's all the more impressive to think uh, about what these services have actually achieved in the face of so many barriers and challenges. So that is a very short summary of the WHO guidance and seven, seven technical packages. It's one part of the work. Uh, I also want to talk about other parts of the work that we're doing as part of the quality rights initiative, specifically uh, areas that we're working in in order to achieve sustainable change in mental health systems and really push forward a, a human rights and per person centered approach within uh, within systems and services. So these are the areas that we're working in include assessing and transforming community mental health services. Uh, they're also about capacity building on human rights in mental health. They're about engaging with people with lived experience and civil society actors as well. And then also it's about reforming policy and law in line with the CRPD and other international uh, human rights standards. So what I want to do now is take you through these different areas of work and also highlight some of the tools that we've developed um, in each of these different areas as well. So starting with um, assessing and transforming services. So as part of our work uh, in this area, we've developed two key tools. We've developed the WHO Quality Rights Assessment Toolkit, which basically outlines the quality and the human rights standards that need to meet need to be met and achieved in services in mental health services it also this toolkit also helps guide countries on how to measure uh, their services against these standards so that's the quality rights toolkit it's based uh, the standards of the toolkit are actually extrapolated they come from the convention on the rights of persons with disabilities they cover issues uh, obviously of quality of care but also human rights issues including legal capacity non-coercion community inclusion and so on and they also the standards also look uh, at issues around recovery and so more recently uh, to accompany this quality rights assessment toolkit we've also developed uh, the guidance module on improving and transforming services uh, and this module basically enables you to directly address the quality and the human rights gaps that would have been identified during the assessment process. Uh, so some of the issues uh, that we address in this new transformation guide is uh, around changing the service culture and the power dynamics within services. It's about defining a shared vision uh, for the service. And it's also about working around uh, working towards the specific priorities, as I said, that would have been identified during the assessment phase uh, and developing very concrete plans in order to address these priorities and what we what what is really sort of key to this this work this development of uh, plans is that it involves not only um, staff at the services but crucially it involves people using the services themselves they are concretely inputting into the development of these transformation plans for the service So now to mention an, another area that we're working in, which is to build capacity around mental health, human rights and recovery. If we're really going to change uh, negative attitudes and cultures and practices uh, that exist within mental health, uh, we really need to build the capacity of all the different stakeholders to understand what it means to implement human rights and recovery in mental health. So that means training health professionals, mental health pr practitioners, people with lived experience, organizations of persons with disabilities, uh, NGOs, policymakers, academics, traditional healers, and so on. Um, and then as a first step in order to achieve this, um, I think it was two years ago, a little more than two years ago, we developed this package of face-to-face -face training materials in the area of mental health, human rights, and recovery. Uh, and <clears throat> again, all the modules here are grounded in the rights outlined in the CRPD. Um, so the idea with these modules is that first they build capacity about around rights, but they also help to develop skills uh, to put these rights into practice. So, uh, so this is really the first time that we have a set of tools that show how the CRPD and other human rights standards can be implemented on the ground in mental health in a very practical way. Uh, the materials recognize that real change requires more than just sort of an incremental 
increase in knowledge, it really requires a fundamental shift in mentality. So the materials go deep into getting people to think about what, you know, inter internalizing what are human rights, what do they mean, what does recovery mean, and then specifically what does human rights mean and what does recovery mean for me personally. So we, we, we did a lot of work to make sure that all of these concepts were well internalized by, for, by the trainees. Um, so here on the slide, you see that we have a group of core modules. Uh, so on the, on the left, we have an introduction to human rights, another module that looks at mental health, disability and human rights. We have one module that looks at recovery and the right to health uh, in mental health and social services. We have yet another module looking at legal capacity and the right to decide, and then another one looking at um, mental health and social services that are free from coercion, violence and abuse. And then on the right hand side, you have a number of specialized modules, basically picking up on some of the key themes of the core modules and going into much more depth. So, for example, we have a module on recovery practices for mental health and well-being. We have another one uh, linked to legal capacity, so looking at supported decision making and advanced planning, and then another one looking at strategies specifically to end the use of, uh, of seclusion and restraint. And just to mention that these materials are out in the world now and being used quite extensively in middle, uh, high and low income countries. But then in order to really be able to reach the scale that we need to in order to really change attitudes and practices in a meaningful and sustainable way, uh, we have also developed this comprehensive e training program on mental health, human rights and recovery. Uh, and the content of this e training is based on the set of face to face training modules that I mentioned in my previous slide. So basically, the idea with this e training is to be able to reach to be able to engage and train many, many more people within a shorter period of time and obviously at a much lower cost than is possible just through face to face workshops alone. And here, really, we're talking about being able to reach thousands of people uh, within and across countries. So, uh, as part of the initial evaluation of this e training, we examined attitudes and uh, practices, practice change uh, for the e training. So, we administered questionnaires before the training and after the training, after people had received their certificates. And the findings uh, of the evaluation showed highly significant uh, positive shifts in people's attitudes on many different challenging areas. So, we saw shifts, saw shifts for example. Uh, on the need to end uh, force and coercion in treatment. We saw shifts in terms of the right of people to self-determination, to legal capacity, in other words, uh, to make their own decisions, including about uh, treatment decisions. We saw a shift in attitudes on the need to, to provide people with choice and information about treatment options and not just propose medication as the solution to everything. And then we also saw attitude shifts in terms of seclusion and restraint and really the need to find alternatives to those practices as well. So all of these issues are actually particularly challenging in the mental health field, uh, and we're really trying to change this using the CRPD framework. Um, some good news that we've had is that we this this e training course has actually been selected to be part of WHO's new academy. So in July, WHO is uh, launching an online academy, uh, which will bring together e-training courses on many different issues. And we've been selected to be on that academy, which is gonna basically, and it's gonna be launched in July, 2021. Uh, and it, this will mean that the e-training will be, will be um, open access to everyone and have a much broader reach than it currently does, although it's still already being used quite extensively. And the course is already available in English, uh, Czech, Turkish, Estonian, Filipino and Bosnian. We're also working with partners to get it translated into other languages, uh, and it will be available, for example, in Spanish and in French as well. Uh, another tool that we've developed that I want to flag is this self help tool on person centered recovery planning for mental health uh, and well being. Basically, the tool builds capacity around developing a recovery plan. So it takes people through how to set up their own personal reco recovery plan. So it's through a series of uh, self reflective exercises, through templates, 
and uh, tools. Basically, this module enables people to ex explore what recovery means to them. It enables them to develop a plan for pursuing their own hopes and goals and dreams and aspirations. Um, this tool also enables people to create their own personal wellness plan and also crucially uh, enables people to plan for difficult times. So what, what kind of response would they want to see happen if they were going through a crisis or in the aftermath of a crisis, for example? So the tool has been designed so that people can use it on their own as their own personal recovery tool, self-help tool, or it can be used in collaboration with others. So, for example, it's also been used. Uh, it can also be used as a framework for creating dialogue between uh, service users and service providers as well. So the next area that I want to talk about is uh, around capitalizing on the enormous expertise that comes from people with people's lived experience uh, and supporting the strengthening of civil society uh, movements in countries in order to really be able to give a voice to this experience and this expertise. So people with lived experience can and are drive, can be and are in many countries drivers of change and really need to be supported in this role. So they need to be invited to sit at the table to discuss policy. They need to sit at the table when law is being reformed. They need to provide their perspectives and also to express how their lives are impacted by these different things. Um, and also importantly, they need to be engaged in the co-development of services and also the development of trainings um, around mental health, human rights and so on. And not only that, but they really need to be uh, engaged in actively delivering services and actively delivering trainings as well. So to date, through this Quality Rights Initiative, we've developed several different guidance documents to promote this engagement with civil society and with people with lived experience. So we've developed um, two peer support modules, for example, one looking at individualized peer support and another looking at peer support groups, whether that be in within services or in the community more generally. And then we've also developed two modules as well around setting up and operating a, a civil society organization and then also a module looking at how to conduct effective advocacy uh, campaigns to inter to make sure that uh, human rights is being integrated into mental health reform. Um, just a word about these materials and all of our materials, they've received enormous amounts of inputs and advice and guidance from people with lived experiences themselves, as well as their organization. And this has been truly crucial in the shaping of all of our work. So finally, we have also just kickstarted the development of new guidance for countries around policy and law reform, um, which will replace some of the old guidance that some of you may be familiar with that we developed on, on these issues, which we formulated actually prior to the CRPD. So it's long overdue that they need, we need to update these. We've officially withdrawn the, the, the old guidance we need now to replace that with new guidance that aligns with the CRPD. And a lot of work needs to be done because provisions uh, on involuntary admission and treatment are current in, in all laws and need to be replaced with provisions around supported decision making, advanced planning and so on. Laws now need to include provisions to look at alternatives to seclusion and restraint and other coercive measure, measures. And we really need policies and laws to explicitly promote community inclusion, uh, participation, empowerment and so on. So probably this is going to be the most challenging aspect of our work, and this is because it requires such a fundamental change to legal and policy frameworks um, and environments that are in place in countries that are entrenched in countries. And that and here we're talking about processes and frameworks that have been in in place for decades, if not more. Um, and although we don't yet have any perfect uh, policies and laws in countries, some countries have recently developed uh, frameworks that are going in the right direction. So just to mention a few, we have, for example, Spain, Peru, the Philippines, Georgia and India, who've all developed recently, very recently, legislation that promotes the right to legal capacity and also which specifically includes provisions around supported decision making and advanced directives. So that's a really positive um, move forward. But even these laws have their shortcomings, they're not perfect, and we have a long way to go 
to, to really truly help countries to, to fully align their policies, their laws with the CRPD and other international human rights standards. So this is a really an urgent piece of work that WHO uh, has now taken on and is uh, pursuing. So I'd like to end there. I'd like to conclude by saying that um, what the COVID pandemic has shown us is it's really brought to light the inadequate and outdated nature of mental health systems and services in many countries worldwide. It's brought to light the damaging effects of institutions, the lack of cohesion uh, in society and social networks. It's brought to light the fact that people are so isolated and marginalized uh, and also the fragmented nature of many mental health systems and services and also their fragility. Um, but what is positive is that we are most definitely seeing um, increased attention to the area of, of mental health. We're hearing a lot of calls for building back better in the aftermath of the pandemic uh, to build better systems and better services that really no longer uh, fail people, particularly when they're needed most, as they have been in the last uh, the last months. Uh, and what we're also seeing is this groundswell of different uh, stakeholders of people with lived experience first and foremost, but also mental health service providers, civil society actors, and also policymakers really questioning the state of mental health systems currently in place today and really calling for a profound change in our approach to mental health. They're really calling for approaches which, like open dialogue, uh, focus entirely on striving to better meet the needs of people with psychosocial disabilities and doing so in a way that is re fully respectful of their human rights. And so now really is the time to take advantage of this momentum uh, in order to bring about real and positive change in mental health systems and services in countries everywhere. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lee. That was wonderful um, to listen to. Um, there aren't uh, many questions here. Um, the language question you all already uh, responded to. Uh, although one wondering um, about the about the process that can you say something about the possible difficulties in producing globally relevant guidance? uh in this around this topic yes, yes certainly yeah yeah can you hear me yeah yes yeah, so, i mean i can say maybe a little bit about the process uh that uh we underwent in in developing for example this who guidance um on rights-based person-centered uh, mental health services so what we did is we initially looked at um the international the the literature out there to see with keywords around human rights, legal capacity, and so, so on to see what services were out there, what literature was out there about those services. That was one strategy that we used and that threw up a number of, um, you know, different, different interesting um, potential services. We also uh, undertook, uh, we also did Google searches um, and also undertook um, an international consultation um, with our network. So we have a big network of people, obviously, because we're headquarters, we work internationally and have uh, sort of deep roots in countries. So we sent out uh, requests for information about services in countries everywhere. And we got a lot of response back and the process was to actually go through and, you know, really uh, determine which services were really uh, promoting uh, the right to legal capacity, non-coercive practices, community inclusion, uh, recovery approaches, and so on. And But what I would say is, yes, there are limitations because um, we, we, we didn't have the, we managed to do the literature searches and the Google searches um, in several languages, but we couldn't do them in all languages. So we did them in, in English, French, Portuguese, Spanish, and I'm forgetting another language and in Russian, I think Russian as well. And uh, so, you know, so we set the cast the net wide in that sense, but obviously you are not going to capture everything, even with those languages as well. So there's that limitation as well. The other limitation is that um, when 
you uh you know in in a lot of low income countries there's not so much literature so so even though there might be services out there that are doing incredible things they're not documented in the literature in the international literature so that's another shortcoming as well but what how we felt that we were able to somewhat to compensate for that was through our international uh, consultations really really insisting really going deep into countries looking at all of our stakeholders across the world and you know at the policy level but also at the ground level as well and 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 getting uh, information that way as well about services but it's a challenge it's a challenge for sure yeah yes Thank you for doing this, uh, really, and, and really the work continues from here uh, in different countries where the word gets uh, spread in, in everywhere. So I am really hopeful about the outcomes here. Mm. We're also very, very hopeful. Um, you know, it's, it's just, it has been, for me, eye-opening to see the incredible work that open dialogue and all of the services are doing really you know an open dialogue ahead of its time quite frankly even before the crpd to really you know push forward uh new types of services services that don't alienate people services that people can actually trust and benefit from and services that people have a say in as well so yeah we're very very pleased it's been very overwhelming and we're really happy it's long overdue it's a shame that this had not been done before, but we're very happy that it's out there now and it seems to have a life of its own, so. Yes, thank you. I'm also looking at the chat box. Um, here is a question. Um, Natalie, this is from Russell Rasak. Uh, Natalie, how do you think people can use this guidance to pressure their, oh, to pressure their governments to use these models? How can we make the case for change and what language arguments do you think they might listen to? Good question. Good question. Well, I think I think that already a lot of people are are um, pressing for for change. You know, I think that uh, well, I think as I said that the that the documents themselves. Um, I can talk about some of the strategies of our collaborators that are already taking on this challenge and. Um, for example, uh, in different parts of the world, they're organizing meetings where they, so service providers and uh, people with lived experience are getting together, organizing meetings and inviting policymakers to these meetings where the services are showcased, where they're talked about, and where also people with lived experience and people using the services, and I think this is really crucial, people using the services are actually able to express how they you know these services have really changed their experience of the mental health service and the mental health system so i think it's very important in that in that way i think um you know the 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 social media around this has 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 really blown up as well so i think that um if people can really be disseminating using social media i, I think it's still very much there in twitter and so on um in terms of uh what we have actually developed and you know this mia we've actually developed um a whole um what do we call it a communication plan around these materials because we have these incredible collaborators we have this incredible network of, of service providers uh that are documented in in the in the documents and uh so we have this very detailed communication plan with lots of incredible ideas that everyone contributed to. So I think if anyone is really interested in engaging in this way, I think they should get in touch with me and we can really sort of outline some of the key strategies that we think will be uh, useful in really addressing governments, ministries of health, social sector and so on. So I think I would be happy to receive any emails from people who want to join in that um, that that work yes thank you there is one more question the last question from darren baker i had attended the wh launch and it struck me that at no point did people talk about evidence so i was curious about how the who sees a rights-based approach in re in relation to an evidence-based approach I mean, what I would say is that the services that we identified 
we 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 called we did not say that they were these were best best practice services. We're talking about good practice services that are using principles of human rights, person centered and recovery approaches. Um, in terms of, but what we what we were very keen to do is uh, as much as possible, and we achieved that is to seek um, evaluations of all the services that we uh, that we identified. Really looking at you know what what they were able to achieve in terms of health and social outcomes, and we we went deep to really understand and and really the selection process was uh, was informed by services that had this level of evaluation as well. Okay. And then there's also one more. Can you comment on the participation of the US in various aspects of the work? We have, uh, we have uh, collaborators everywhere. We have, um, for sure, we have lots of partners in the US, including um, organizations of persons with disabilities, um, we have academics, we have, um, you know, policymakers as well who have contributed to the work. You, if, you, if you look at our acknowledgements list, you'll be able to see everyone in the US who was involved. But I mean, the list is very, very long. What is critical to us, as I said, is to get a good balance of different stakeholders and also crucially from many different countries. And so we really take pride in undertaking um, in-depth international reviews, several. We did several international reviews of all of these materials um, and involving low, middle and high income countries. Um, so we pride ourselves on that for sure. Yeah. Okay, I think it's time. Thank you. It was really an honor and a privilege to have you here. Well, it's been very so. nice and 